In this video, I'm going to show you a little bit about how I put together this drone animation flying in a forest in Blender. So first I created a basic environment, just a plane subdivided for the ground. And then you can see here, this is some of the controls for the drone itself. So with this curve here, if I rotate it in the Y axis, you can see that that's how the propeller spins. In the graph editor, you can see that I have two keyframes here and I've set their handle type to vector and then the extrapolation will be linear so that it'll go on rotate into perpetuity as the animation plays back so you can see here the camera is just parented to the drone very simple so that as the drone moves the camera follows and of course I've also set various keyframes on the camera rotation and location as well so here in the Z location I've added a noise modifier to the F curve now you want to be subtle with this but this will help increase realism because it uh, helps to add a little bit of randomness to the movement almost like a handheld camera shot you can see here how that looks it's subtle but it helps a lot so I did that for all the other animation curves so here's some tree leaf animations from the Grove it's an add-on in Blender that lets you plant various tree species so you can see here I'm just going to demo it I'm going to plant five trees we're going to space them out grow these of course you can change animation settings like the animations on the leaves. You can continue the growth process. One feature I really like is the prune function where you can selectively remove various branches. Which is useful for pruning leaves in the drone's flight path. So here I'm using GeoScatter. It's an add-on for scattering various objects in Blender on a surface or multiple surfaces. So here I'm scattering some leaves and grass and other objects from the vegetation and forestation add-ons. So you can see I'm just changing the wind settings here and then I copy those settings to say the green plants here. So we're going to go and copy these, paste them, and now you can see that these plants are inheriting the various speed and strength settings for the wind. So here are just some of the basic shaders I made for the drone. You can see here for the light it's just an emissive color with a strength of 1.0 on the principal BSDF shader. And I'm going to turn off optics denoising in the viewport now. Uh, it'll be more grainy, but we'll see a little bit more detail. So here's the drone motor, and you can see again a very simple material with a metallic of 1.0 and roughness of 0.3. You just toggle the overlays in the viewport. So just some basic shaders to get the point across. Nothing really advanced in terms of shading on this model. So here are the render settings. I use the Cycles Path Tracing Renderer on GPU Compute. The scene only really used 4.3 gigabytes of video memory to render. I'm using 0.01 .01 noise threshold and 4096 samples, which is really good. Uh, the Light Tree feature, which helps to speed up the rendering and the lighting calculations. Animated seeds so that the noise pattern is unique per frame, which gives a bit of randomness and is important for rendering animations. Now in the light paths I use the preset full global illumination which gives everything 32, it's nice and simple. For clamping I set direct light to 50 and so that helps to reduce or eliminate fireflies. Filter glossy is by default 1.0, I bring that down to 0 so that I can get a more unbiased result in my glossy reflections. So motion blur is important, I enable it and by default you'll get the 180 degree shutter angle. On this scene I did not use persistent data because there's quite a few deformations going on but on simpler scenes you can enable persistent data which will keep the data around in memory so that when the animation advances to the next frame it does not have to retranslate the entire scene. It can just use the data that's already in memory. So it's very useful but on this scene I didn't enable it. So the standard view transform in Blender is like a standard profile on a camera. It only has maybe around 8 or 9 stops of dynamic range. Filmic has been in Blender for many years and it's much better but it does not really tone map bright colors very well. Now in Blender 4.0 we have AGX, which has a, a little bit more dynamic range than Filmic, probably 15 stops or so. And as you can see, the sky is not overexposed and the colors just look overall much better. In the output, I set it to 1920 by 1080 and the frame range was set and then I used uh, OpenEXR Multilayer and rendered 32-bit floating point EXR files, which cannot be overexposed. So the render passes I output were the z-depth pass and the denoising data pass so I can spatially denoise the image sequence in the compositor in Blender. So here you can see I've loaded the image sequence into the free EXR RAM preview program called DJV and it'll load the images into memory. Even though it looks overexposed that's just because tone mapping has not been applied. You can see I can change my exposure down and again there's no tone mapping so this image is not a final image. So here in Blender's compositor I've imported in the EXR image sequence and I've ran the depth pass through an exposure node to tone it down and then through a color ramp node to further finesse the contrast of the depth map and we're going to be using this so that we can 
add in some haze or some particles in the atmosphere, particulates, which as you look in the distance it always uh, reduces contrast a bit and reduces saturation. So that is the way things are in real life and I thought I'd imitate that in this scene as well to increase the realism. And then we mix that onto the denoise result. So now that I have my final exposure and tone mapping set, I can go and export this out as a 16-bit PNG image sequence, which is losslessly compressed, so we're not losing any quality here. So here in DaVinci Resolve, you can see the PNG image sequence imported, and you can see quite a bit of splotchiness between frames. That's because it was only spatially denoised, and now you can see the result after temporal denoising with Neat Video, which is an excellent program for denoising your footage. So what I did was just applied it to the shot, and I used the generic profile, just change the noise level settings, as well as overall just the generic noise pattern. Then once that was set to my liking, I went to the Adjust and Preview tab. And here I just turned off Spatial Denoising because we already did that in Blender. And under Temporal Denoising, Quality is set to High. Radius is just one frame, so I didn't want to use two frames because that can reduce the quality of the leaves. And then by using Local Flicker Check, I'm able to find the balance between an excessive versus a limited amount of Temporal Denoising. And there's the results you can see before Temporal Denoising with Neat Video and after. And then I just render this out as a QuickTime DNxHR, which is uh, the Windows equivalent of Apple ProRes. So in Topaz Video Enhanced AI, I like to double up the resolution from 1080p to 4K and set the parameters to manual and just use Estimate. And while it's estimating, I then change my video settings to ProRes 422HQ. And once it's done processing, you'll see that there's a significant quality increase from the 1080p to the 4K. But you want to be careful because Video Enhanced AI is often a little bit aggressive in its upscaling, so I just sometimes lower some of these settings like Dehalo, I actually want that turned off. And then a few of the other settings I lower as well, such as compression and improve detail and sharpen. From there, I export out the video from Topaz AI and bring it into DaVinci Resolve, set my timeline to 4K, or in this case, UHD 4K. I then do some post-processing on the video. So I use Dehancer Pro, which is an excellent plugin for things like film grain and vignetting, and I can do some other filmic sort of effects in here, and it makes the footage look a lot more realistic and less computer-generated and then add a little bit of glow compositing screen space for a little bit of a highlight bloom effect. I think in this case I overdid it a little bit. It's always good to be subtle with that sort of thing. So from there I export out the footage to DNxHR again, which will be perceptually lossless. From there I import it into Handbrake, choose my preset of production max, change the constant quality to 8, which will preserve the noise patterns, and H.265 is the video encoder, and from there I can get a quality result that is a much smaller file size. And then I'll be able to share that and upload it. So I hope this video was a little helpful in giving a sense of what's required to produce these animations. I will be producing much more complex animations in the future. And of course, I still do videography as well. I like both topics, 3D computer graphics and videography. So keep an eye out for future videos and thank you for watching.